And it's Ken Kreitzer for Sons of American Legion Radio, White Plains, New York today, commemoration of the 1776 Battle of White Plains that helped save the revolution and have a chance to talk with one of the living historians participating today, and that is Philip Weaver. Sir, tell us about the day, uh, a big turnout for the commemoration. Yes, it is. We've done, we've had a very good day. Uh, our unit's been coming here every year for, I'd say, 10 years, rough guess. Um, we're invited by the Historical Society and the, sp the host unit that's sponsoring the event for us would be Pauline's Levies. It's in New York. L glorified militia units, what called the levies. They were state troops. Um, we do, my unit does the 2nd New York Regiment from 1775. Uh, we were actually, our regiment was not here at the battle that we're commemorating today. We're not really doing a reenactment, we're doing a, actually just, a dem, uh, just an encampment and a, and a talk to the different people. Uh, my unit was 1775. Our unit was actually formed, went up to Canada, lost reorganized, came south, all be and disbanded all before the Declaration of Independence was even signed. So by the time the Battle of White Plains came along, we are now five months later. So it's uh, time in the, in the 18th century varies quite a bit. When we do the 75 campaign, this is when New York was at the start of the revolution. They weren't sure what was going to happen. Canada uh, was above, very close to New York. They just had a Quebec Act was passed, which allowed... Uh, Papist Canada to come down the lower the border into New York. This upset a lot of the Protestants in New York. So they were very antsy. And then that little thing happened at Fort Ticonderoga up on Lake Champlain in the northern end of Lake George where Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys took the fort from the British. And as those of you who remember the pencil box, Ethan Allen, big tall guy, they, they took that fort. But the next day there was a problem. Ethan Allen didn't, couldn't defend it. He was screaming for help. The, the, found, the founding companies of our regiment were actually the ones that went to his aid because he was not going to be able to hold the fort. And that got New York into the American Revolution the hard way. And that's what we're that, we're that first unit with the first establishment of the Continental Army. We're actually, our officers were commissioned by Continental Congress, but the men were paid by the province of New York. We were still English citizens. We celebrate the king's birthday. So it's a very bizarre time for people to do what we do. And we say living history is a more professional term than reenacting. Reenacting has certain negative connotations. So we prefer to use the term living history. How about, sir, if I could just ask, uh, one of the things you've studied, uh, the period, uh, what the soldiers went through, the militiamen, the patriots of that era, what were some of the sacrifices that they made to be serving our 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 just our country in its first months literally uh it, they sacrificed a lot oh they all do uh because you're you're going in an uncertain situation you're originally going to defend ticonderoga and all of a sudden somebody says we're going to invade canada so now you're going to canada to attack the french who you weren't sure if they're going to be on your side or not now history teaches us that when you go to a country you think oh they're all going to be on our side this is what you walk into. So now you're, you're in that political place, and now you have your food supplies are limited. Uh, they had to eat a lot of fish and things on that campaign. They didn't have a lot of fresh meat and things like this. So you're living in deprivation. At one point, we know the Connecticut troops were given the New Yorkers tents. So when our guys started out, originally, they didn't have any tents. They didn't go north. On, by the time they got their act together, they didn't get to the to Ticonderoga until late August. So they went north to Canada after Labor Day. And everything was on foot. Oh, yeah, they were all on foot. They went by boat. They, they did, when, they, when they say they didn't march, they all went by bateau, but they still have to travel. And if you know anything about the upstate New York and in the Adirondacks and you go through Lake Champlain, you get up to Labor Day, it's cold up there. And it's getting colder and colder and colder. So when they finally went north, so they're making an attack when they should have done in the summer. They're already, they're leaving in the fall. So you have immediate deprivation, problems, cold, wet. Uh, you had a lot of rain. Uh, we know they had, got their tents got wet. They tried to heat them. They probably put slits in the top of the tents to heat them up with fire. They, did, they were burning canvas. You know, everybody gets sick. Smallpox came around then. They had to deal with smallpox inoculations. Killed a number of officers and men, uh, especially at, Sh at Fort Chambly, which was a French fort that the New Yorkers uh, held. One of our officers in the, in the original 2nd New York 
we know for a fact, got inoculated for smallpox over the winter of 76. Because he was given an opportunity to go home, he decided to stay. His, pension, his wife's pension application files have all these letters from him. And he writes back, he said, I'm going to stay. They're giving me command of the company. The other two officers are leaving. I'm staying. And he's going to get inoculated for smallpox. Well, it worked. He got it, and it killed him. He never made it home. Sir, maybe just ask you, uh, how many of those patriots who you describe uh, survived to the end of the war to see the defeat of the British in, at that time? I can't give you that specific answer, but I can tell you this. I've been studying the members of the 2nd New York in 1775, all the men. Uh, I've tracked out. There's a 720 man, technically, in the number of the regiment. So I checked out, oh, I'd say I got about 350, 400 names, and I've willed it down. So basically, I've been able to track most of these men down, and I've got a lot of detailed stuff on about 300 of them. And so and I've come down to where there's about 70 men that were, uh, that I can document having served after that initial year, the, the spring, the fall, and into the following spring when they came home after it warmed up. So that's 10% that ever served in a Continental Army after that first year. So you got to think that as time went, you, so very few of these men stayed in the entire war. Somebody like Joseph Paul Martin, the famous private Yankee Doodle, he was a Connecticut soldier who was here in Westchester County, he was in New York. I think he was actually at White Plains. He had he went home for six months, but other than that, he served the entire eight years of the war, from 16 until he was 24. What do, you think the, what do you think the mindset had to be of a soldier, a patriot, a volunteer, uh, to uh, the uh, 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 starting U.S. Army in its first year? Uh, what do you think their thought was about uh, what was going to happen? That's hard because it varies. In the beginning of the war, you're, you're, you're trying to defend for your rights. You're fighting to, to, for, your, for your, yourself and your private and your rights as an Englishman. Once 76 hit and the declaration, now you're fighting for independence. That changes a lot. Uh, we know for a fact that the Colonel of the 4th New York in 75 went over to the British. Lieutenant Colonel Rodolphus Rissima, who was here at White Plains with the 3rd New York, he went over to the British, and he actually started a Loyalist regiment called the Royal Regiment of Reformees, of Reformed Continental Army officers and soldiers. So he went on the Loyalist side. Unlike Benedict Arnold, Ritzema did it above board and kind of legally, and he finished, he ended, and he went to the other side. He didn't give away plans or secrets, where, where Benedict Arnold actually gave away the paperwork. So this, this, this changing sides was quite common, very common. Philip Weaver from Continental Consulting, uh, uh, here at the White Plains uh, commemoration of the Battle of White Plains. How can uh, interested uh, viewers uh, find out more information about your uh, newsletters and publications? Okay, uh, my personal, not the Second New York Regiment, which has it's called the uh, Second New York Provincial Battalion. You can find us on Facebook. My personal stuff with Continental Consulting can be found at conconsult.com c-o-n-c-o-n-s-u-l.com you will find many of my articles are printed out there books I sell uh, my own book The Greatest Hits of the Colonial Chronicle which is about my newsletter um, a few uh, and back issues of the newsletter the newsletter is currently out of print except for one one issue that's been owed for about eight years but <laughs> you can get copies of the old newsletter you certainly can get The Greatest Hits book which is very good and very entertaining and uh there's a lot of fun stuff out there. I try to make it entertaining. It also has links to various other organizations and places to see and things to do. Well, Philip Weaver from Continental Consulting, great to chat with you today. The commemoration of the Battle of White Plains from October of 1776 and helping us to remember America's first veterans. Thank you. It's my pleasure. That's what we're here for. Good to see you. This is Ken Kratzer for Sons of the American Legion Radio and RallyPoint.com. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate it.